to introduce Paddy. Uh, Paddy studied aeronautical engineering at Queen's University, Belfast, graduating in 1986 with BN honours and successfully studied for an MSc in electrical and electronic engineering in 2003. His project was guidance and control of hypersonic projectiles. So Paddy has 38 years experience in the defense industry, including the design, development, manufacture, weapons integration, and testing of subsonic, transonic, and supersonic missiles, and uncrewed systems, including target aircraft and transonic stores dispensers. Paddy joined Short Brothers as a graduate in 1986 and was appointed to Short Defense Systems Division, which eventually became Thales Air Defense Limited. He was senior technical expert of missile architectures for the Thales Group, chief engineer on Star Streak, uh, LMM Martlet, BT-1, and Freefall LMM, was head of the missile capability team and design authority for all Thales missiles. Paddy left Thales in April 2022. Paddy is currently Chief Technologist, European Space and Defence for Spirit Aerosystems, aka Short Brothers, uh, responsible for hypersonics, uncrewed systems and effects. And Paddy was awarded the position of Senior Technical Fellow for Spirit Aerosystems in 2024 and appointed Distinctive Capability Lead for Performance Architectures, responsible for strategic planning for Spirit's future activities. Paddy's a fellow of the um, Aeronautical Society, a panel member of the Weapon Systems and Technology Group, and a member of the UK MOD Hypersonic Expert Panel. He holds many patents, has published several papers, and regularly presents at national and international conferences. So, without further ado, Paddy. Well, thanks everybody for, for making the effort to come down and see me tonight. I was never sure whether when I arrived here there might only be one or two, so it's, it's always a relief to see that there's some people here. Um, so uh, just a few um, explanations. So originally, I mean, I, I worked for Spirit Aerosystems, but uh, any of you who have worked for a large corporate organisation will know that in order to get a presentation released, um, it has to go higher and higher and higher and higher. So it sort of ran out of time. So um, this is not authorised by Spirit Air System. This is me. Um, so anything I say here is um, my, my view. Um, there's nothing on here which is Spirit material as such. It's all from the internet and so on. So um, hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy what we have to say. So uh, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with, with Short Brothers, but really they, they started on, on the Isle of Sheppey. Um, so the, the, the picture you see there, um, top left, it's, it's a historic photo of the Aero Club, and it was taken on the Isle of Sheppey in 1909. But the interesting thing about that was all of the, um, all the original pioneers of aerospace are there. So um, apart from the Short Brothers, which were Oswald, Horace, and Eustace, you also have um, JTC Moore Brabazon, former, uh, later known as Lord Brabazon um, of Tara. And you've also got Wilbur and Orville Wright in that picture, and Mr. C.S. Rolls, who you'll know from uh, Rolls-Royce. Now, the Short Brothers entered the aviation business in about 1901 or so, and they're producing aerial balloons at Hove in Sussex. Uh, in 1906, they won first prize for excellence of construction at the Aero Club exhibition. And in 1909, the Wright, Bro Wright Brothers placed the world's first production contract with Short Brothers to make six Wright Flyers. And it's interesting, we talked earlier about the way things have changed now, and if you're trying to design a system now, the specification is about that thick of paper. There was no specification for the Wright Flyer. The drawings were produced in a, in a book. Um, the contract was written on one side of, I think probably full scap, you would have called it in those days. Um, we have the original contract still in Short Brothers in Belfast there. Um, and the Short Brothers themselves had to take measurements off the right flyer and, and draw them into their, 
their sketchbooks. And they made the six right flowers from their own measurements, which was um, 18 inches plus or minus the peak of your cap with that sort of level of, of tolerancing. So um, the first ever production contract in the world was with Short Brothers. They built those in a new factory um, at Shell Beach on the Isle of Sheppey. Um, and the first UK pilots, in fact, were their licenses were attain, <coughs> attained in these aircraft. Um, in 1909, they also won um, a, the, an award of £1,000 for the first aircraft to fly a circular mile. Um, they then moved to Rochester in 1914. And in 1915, they established an airship factory at Cardington. Um, in 1920, Schwartz produced the Silver Streak, which is the, in the top right there. It's a, it was the first all-metal stress skin aircraft in the world. In 21, um, they produced a Singapore flying boat. Now, just think about this now. So, so they made um, Wright Flyers in 1909. They were making all these other things. 1920, they did the first stress skin aircraft. 21, they did the Singapore flying boat. Can you imagine that now? Uh, now it is making two or three aircraft at the same time and probably turning them around in about a year or two. Um, those were the days, weren't they? Um, in 1932, the short Sarafand flying boat was first flown, and that was the largest ever aircraft built at that date. In 1937, though, um, as the war was approaching, they, uh, the government decided to move them all away from the London area, obviously, because they were um, concerned about um, the, what would there then be the Blitz. So in 1937, in conjunction, conjunction with Harland and Wolfe in Belfast, they established a factory. So if anything has been to Belfast, the, the, um, in fact, Belfast Airport is actually the short airfield. Um, Belfast, uh, the Short Brothers Aircraft co Company is all around that airfield and it's right beside Harlan and Wolf. So, um, and if you're over, ever over, the Titanic exhibition is really worth seeing. So one of the most uh, famous things to come out of Belfast was the Titanic. Now I know it sunk, but when it, when it left Belfast, it was still good. <laughs> it was all good when we last saw it. So, um, uh, 1938, the short Sunderland flying boat entered service, um, and 1941 was a short Stirling bomber, um, which was the first monoplane four-engine heavy bomber that entered service, and they built about 2,500 of those. In 1943, though, um, Short Brothers in Harlan was taken into government ownership, and from those days on, it was all government ownership, right up until 1989. So I joined in 1986, and it was under government ownership. I remember that well because the toilet paper was, do you remember that shiny stuff you used to get? Yes. With, uh, it was made of Teflon and 0% friction. You know, that's, <laughs> that's the one. So um, uh, that was Short Brothers in Harland. Um, now, in, in 1952, we built 130 Canberras, and we'll talk a bit more about the Canberra later on. And in 1957, um, the Shorts SC-1 was built. That was the first vertical lift takeoff aircraft in the world, and we achieved the first transition from vertical to horizontal takeoff in 1957. In 1964 was when things started to go down, really. You know, they, they built the Shorts Belfast, which is the biggest transporter at that time. It was built for the RAF. Um, they built 10 off. I think there were, there were many more were contracted, but the, I think the Labour government came in, if you remember. Um, it was the same time that a lot of defence contracts were cancelled, and, and some of the, the older members might remember the TSR2 was cancelled at the same sort of time. So, uh, and that sort of put Shorts into a really precarious position. And, um, so they had to do a lot of different things now. So, um, but in, in 1976 then, um, Sky Spy, which was the first vertical takeoff and launch drone, if you want to call it that, it was a surveillance system, a ducted fan system was, was built and flown. And when I started, a lot of the guys who had worked in that were still in senior positions in the company. And in fact, the, the, the Sky Spy was still in the factory when I was there. And it was only in the early 90s when um, the accountants started taking control of things where um, we were being measured on return on utilized assets. So we had this asset which wasn't making any money, so it was crushed. You know, it was a real shame. Um, so 
part of the recovery from the, the cancellation of Belfast was also the smaller aircraft we built, like the Sky Van in 1963, the SD330 in 1974, and the 360 in 1981. And the Shorts Tucano then, um, its first flight was in 1986. The RAF ordered about 130. Uh, and over the 30 years of service, there were, there were no fatalities in that. So it, it was quite a distinguished career. Um, Shorts was acquired by Bombardier in 89 and then by Spirit Aerosystems from the US in, in 2020. Um, but our history, apart from all of the aircraft, also includes guided weapons design manufacture going right back to the early 1950s with the general purpose vehicle, green light test vehicle, which became CCAT, and then obviously the blowpipe shorts, Javelin, Starstreak, and, and, and so on. So we've, we've been around for a long time. Now, I've been there a long time, but not the 116 years of history. I've, I've only been there 38, which, uh, and it seems like a lot longer. So um, I'm sure you know all this, but just to run through, there's a lot of um, terminology which um, is used for UAVs. And RPV is what I was brought up with. You know, it used to be the RPV conference we would have went on, the remotely piloted vehicles. Then it became unmanned or uncrewed, um, uncrewed combat, uncrewed air systems, uh, uncrewed combat air systems. Now, the, the flavour of the month, if you like, in the UK is the Autonomous Collaborative Platform, ACP. And in the US, they call them CCAs, or Collaborative Combat Aircraft. Um, and then drone can be any of the above, but um, or any cut system from very small to very large. And I just put this bit on the bottom, So, and a lot of people ask this sort of question. So what's the difference between a guided drone with an explosive payload and a guided weapon? And the quick answer is nothing. Obviously, you could spend all day debating that, but I think if you're on the receiving end, you wouldn't really care anyway. So the first section is really about UK guided weapon research. And it's in here because it leads into the unmanned systems. These were effectively the first uncrewed systems. And I know that's a bit of a stretch, but it's also one of my hobbies and my interests. Um, so I wanted to put in something that I was really keen on as well to lead into the unmanned systems. So um, just go into that. <laughs> now, a lot of this, um, it's, I'd really love, if any of you guys are, are, have a background in, in weapons, I'd really appreciate your comments on this because it's trying to gather information when a lot of the people who were involved have passed on or it, it was all classified. But So if way back after the Second World War and the V2s and so on, the UK decided they had to get into guided weapons. So the RAE was given the lead on air-to-air -air missile research or, or, or ground-to-air missile research. Um, they produced a, a variety of test rounds to explore the basics of rocket propulsion, aerodynamics, and guidance, and that was with the assistance of many of the agencies. So TRE was the Telecommunications Research Establishment. RRE was the Radar Research Establishment. Um, they produced two early test vehicles. Um, the first was Controlled Test Vehicle 1, and the second was a Rocket Test Vehicle. Um, CTV-1 was used for aerodynamic investigations and the development of free flight instrumentation, measurement techniques. It was also the UK's first beam riding missile, uh, and, and you know, so short continued the beam riding all the way through. It's, it's later beam riding that they, or sorry, Thales use, use now. Um, CTV-1 was also tested with various arrangements of, of rocket boosters. Um, the beam riding work was done in, in cooperation with the telecommunication research establishment, um, who were responsible for the guidance aspects. CTV culminated in the CTVS, which itself took over various forms. Um, the CTVS Series 1 was designed for aerodynamic measurements on a coasting dart at high velocities or high incidences and high altitudes. And Series 2 was used for kinetic heating investigations. And it's interesting, you know. Coming back to where we are now and the drive for hypersonics, the work that was done then was leading into the hypersonic regime. And a lot of the early work that was done um, on UK hypersonics up to um, our, our own satellite launch systems was all done around this same period. Um, CTV S Series 3 was an upper atmosphere sounding rocket, later known as Skylark. Some of you might have, might have heard of that one. And it's still providing a valuable service. Now, CTV-1 was uh, boosted by um, a trio of rocket motors for a flight of about 10 seconds. 
It had four rectangular wings and the vehicle possessed separate ailerons and rudders in line with the wings, so there was no interdigitation between the tails and the, and the wings. So, so you're, you're tending to get weight turbulence off the wings onto the tails, which caused some instabilities in that. Um, CTV-1 was used to test various control systems and develop also the recording systems. So remember back in the 50s, this was not so easy. Um, the recording systems were quite difficult. You're actually recording the information in the vehicle and then recovering the vehicle later to, to um, get the system back out of it. It was also used for some of the very early radio telemetry trials and had a five channel system installed and tested. Um, further work continued, including command guidance techniques, which were later applied to surface air missiles and particularly anti-tank weapons. Um, in all 13 surface air missile trials um, took place and 26 flights for anti-tank weapon development. The beam riding work was done in cooperation with TRE, as I said, um, and then just moving on. Um, yeah, so. CTV-4 was a seeker test bed, which was used in 53-54 um, for CW radar homing trials for Red Duster, which is codenamed for Bristol Bloodhound 1, Red Shoes, which was codenamed for English Electric Thunderbird 1, and Thunderbird 1 is a great name, isn't it? Um, you can nearly make a TV series about that one. Um, CTV-4 also formed the basis of the HTV, which is a homing test vehicle for the de Havilland Fire Streak AAM which was used for ground trials and boosted by three five-inch um, rocket motors. Here's a picture of CTS Series 1. Um, the final member of this family was to become the longest lived. It was designed by Frank Hazel of the Royal Aircraft Establishment Aerodynamics Section. Um, it was a, a flight test vehicle known as the Cruciform Moving Wing Test Vehicle, the CMWTV and it was used for high altitude pitch roll yaw control development and in the yellow feather seeker, seeker trials. It was designed for aerodynamic measurements on a coasting dart at high incidence and high altitude and it was used to develop polar control systems which were later used on Bristol surface air missiles. It had detachable nose cones for testing materials under kinetic heating for hypersonic research related to re-entry vehicles. Um, it was an upper atmosphere sounding rocket, which became Skylark, as I mentioned, and that remained in use well into the 1980s. It was used for re-entry vehicle development and was even proposed as an anti-ballistic missile. It was based on a Raven rocket motor and capable of launching a 150-pound payload to high altitudes, and in the early 1960s it could reach 80,000 feet when fitted with an additional Cuckoo boost motor. So what's all that got to do with Belfast? Well, uh, like I said, I sort of stretched it a wee bit here and there, but CTV-1 led into the general purpose vehicle. But interestingly, um, on my desk, I have this um, gyroscope, and it's been, you know, I saved it from many of the, the cleaning outs that there were, you know, I was always interested in, 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 in history, and several times they were doing clearing out and throwing stuff out, and I rescued this over my career and came to when I was leaving Tallis and nobody wanted it, you know. So I have this, this gyroscope and it's inscribed on the side as uh, CTV-1. So um, this gyro would have been used um, as a roll position gyroscope. Um, you can see there's one of the, um, the resistors at the, the, the top, at the, the potentiometers at the top, which give you the position, your roll position. Um, in pitch, and there would have been another one on the side in terms of yaw. Interestingly, this one, it had a, a brass um, mass, um, a spinning mass, which had a lot of notches on it. It's actually spun up with an airline. So you, on, the, on the range, you would have stuck an airline into this thing, spun it up to whatever, 100,000 RPM or something, disconnected. It would have had a certain amount of time before it started to slow down and then topple. But um, so that was the initiation for gyroscopes. Uh, so like I say, have that on my desk. And if anybody's familiar, <coughs> the serial number is RNS722. Now I think that was Sperry gyroscopes, but I don't know if anyone knows who RNS were. I'd be glad to listen to you. But I think it was Sperry who did the gyroscopes in, in those days. So this is um, RTV1, which was the genesis of the general purpose vehicle. Um, 
It had a diameter of nine inches and a length of about 16 feet. It shared the four rectangular wings of CTV-1, but it had a set of four control fins, which worked differentially to control the vehicle's roll pitch yaw. So you could have two for elevator, you could use the other ones for aileron, you could produce roll pitch yaw um, demands. The initial version was used to develop beam riding techniques, but a later version was fitted with um, a warhead and also fusing. And in fact, it was an RTV-1Q that conducted the first ever interception of a target drone by a guided weapon, and, and that was in 1954. Although there were a lot of rumours around Aberporth at the time um, that suggested that perhaps the Firefly flew into the path of the RTV-1Q rather than the other way around. Um, the problems of recovery, though, at Aberporth were... Um, uh, were addressed by the development of parachute recovery, and you'll see that in, hopefully in, the, in the, one of the videos I'll show you later on. So it was fitted with a system that could slow the vehicle down from Mach 1.25, and then when it, when it fell into the sea, it deployed an uh, inflated balloon, basically, which floated it to the surface, and it could be, it could be recovered. So the GPV was actually the short Elliot um, general purpose vehicle. Um, it was a defence research tool which was used in the early 1950s. So in, in January 1951, the RAE Guided Weapons Department said that the present design of RTV2 is admittedly a costly and unversatile vehicle, which we feel unable to support as a long-term venture, but it has the advantage of being half-developed with some of the teething structural problems uh, and bush problems overcome. So it was decided to redesign the vehicle and they handed the airframe development to Shorts. And in Shorts' hands, this became known as the general purpose test vehicle. And interestingly, the top picture there, top right, that's actually my office now. <laughs> and it hasn't changed a bit. You know, maybe it's a bit dirtier than it was then, but um, that's what we call the guided weapons production unit. Uh, in fact, it's called the GWPU in Shorts or nowadays, but no one else apart from me knows why what GW stands for. Um, but that was built in Belfast. Now, like I said, it was a big beast. It was sort of 26 feet or so. Um, but the wider scope of the project um, was to cover rocket engine development, homing systems, moving wing controls, and solid rocket sustainers, amongst others. The Elliott brothers um, were responsible for the guidance, equipment to be used in conjunction with it. So GPV was... Uh, 26 feet 6 inches um, and that's 8.1 meters for the heart of hearing and it had a diameter of about 17 inches or 44 centimeters it was powered by a HTP kerosene rocket engine um, there were 8 demon rocket motors and a wraparound configuration provided launch boost um, and as I was saying earlier GPV is most noteworthy for its recovery system and this involved two parachutes the parachutes. The first slowed the vehicle down from supersonic speeds, the second one lowered it into the sea. Once in the sea, a flotation bag kept the vehicle afloat until it could be recovered um, by RAF or sea rescue. So this is a video um, of one of the early GPV launches and I love the voice. It's a 1950s BBC voice so you'll hopefully you appreciate it. <laughs> The vehicle streaks off at thousands of miles an hour, its brief life one of incandescent power. The space behind it, alive with radio information coming and going, until, far out over the water, the motor cuts and the vehicle tumbles into the sea. There's the flotation bag. A launch put out to recover the vehicle, suspended from this balloon floating on the surface. This, then, is a typical trial. The vehicle, one of many. The information gained, just another small piece in the jigsaw puzzle of man's efforts to conquer new medium. I love it when he says it's a, it's a typical trial. If any of you've been involved in guided weapons, a typical trial is that you never recover the hardware. <laughs> and you spend several months looking for it at a later stage. So... Um, Anyway, that moved on into um, what was called the Green Light Test Vehicle. Uh, again, that was another research project uh, which was set up to investigate the control of a short-range air defence missile using command-to-line-of-sight guidance. Um, 
the first firing took place at Aberport uh, in Wales in the same year. So again, that was 1956. Um, by this time, Shorts knew that the Royal Navy was working toward developing a requirement for a new short-range air defence missile system to replace the Bofors gun. The company decided to develop a solution to the Navy requirement themselves, which hadn't been released at that point, um, using technologies developed from the other programmes uh, and from GLTV, such as command and line of sight guidance and a host of other new ideas. In 1956, the Royal Navy finally released an operational requirement for its air defence missile, which so, you know, subsequently closely matched what shorts were producing. And you can sort of see that still today. You know, sometimes it's easier to take um, a requirement somebody else has written for you whenever there's nobody available to, to do things. So, but working with the Royal Navy, they came up with the best solution at that stage. So in 1957, shorts were awarded a contract to equip the Royal Navy with the new missile, which is known as the SeaCat missile. Um, and again, I've got a, a video for that. So by 1958, the need for dedicated test vehicles, particularly for propulsion, had more or less disappeared from the guided weapons field. So apart from test vehicles that were more or less prototypes of the next generation of weapons, such as the green light test vehicle, um, which for short SeaCat, uh, it was fired in, initially fired into bales of straw to test the launcher um, without a range. And I, I have seen videos of um, the blowpipe missile being fired into bales of straw, so I know that's true. Um, so the knowledge gained during the GPV and the GLTV on command links and remote guidance was subsequently used in remotely piloting aircraft and, and other uncrewed systems. And this is a Again, this is on my desk. Uh, this is a CCAT gyro. So you can see it's quite similar to the, um, the GLTV gyro. It has one significant difference, so in that rather than being spun up with an airline, the, the spinning mass there um, has a small explosive charge in it with some nozzles. So you fired it up and it, it uh, basically like it, it spun at high speed due to the, the small nozzles. Um, again, it was a, a position gyro. Um, it gave you your your role and in, in your position, or sorry, your pitch and your positions. So, um, sorry, that was a roll gyro. Yeah, it's a roll gyro. Mm -hmm. So I, I used to have more than one of these, but again, I had to throw a lot of them out as it was coming. And when I was a young cub, we were able to, if you tied a bit of string around that, lots and lots and lots of times, and spun it, you could get it going at us, you know, to the point where it was acting as a gyroscope, and you could feel the torque in it as you were trying to, trying to move it. So, it was a, I mean, very effective system. Um, that one was serial number twelve thousand four hundred ninety-eight. So, uh, and SeaCat ended up being in service with I think about nineteen uh, countries around the world. Interestingly, it was um, all of our friends in those days, like Argentina and the Shah of Iran bought CCAT as well. So, um, yeah, and then when, when it came to the, the Falklands, um, they were firing Tiger Cat, the ground-based version, at us, and we were firing CCAT at, at them. So, so maybe we live in interesting times. Okay, so we'll move away from the early guided weapon stuff into um, some of the early uh, uncrewed aerial systems. So the first one, um, was actually a remotely piloted Canberra. Now, I know Shorts weren't the designer of the original Canberra, but we were responsible for converting uh, a number of time-expired Canberra B2s into unmanned radio-controlled <coughs> radio missile target aircraft. But, but right up into the late 80s, in fact, we were still refurbishing Canberras. And, um, and I remember a story when I was a young lad about used to have in the fuel tanks of the Canberra, they used to have um, mattresses and sleeping bags for the guys on night shift because you could hide in the fuel tanks and get a good sleep. Um, I don't think they'd be allowed to do that nowadays. Um, but there were two prototypes and 10 production Canberra U10s produced, followed by six improved Canberra U14s. So these aircraft were controlled from the ground um, by VHF radio and equipped to provide feedback on their own performance as well as that of missiles aimed at them. So they had missed distance indicators and, and so on on board. Um, they were mostly used in Wimmera, which is in, in, the, uh, in the middle of Australia. It's quite a big range, um, which is probably a good idea. 
um, where they were used as targets for several new British missiles, including the English Electric Thunderbird. They're also used um, from HMS Girdle Ness, the Royal Navy's guided weapons trial ship based at the Royal Naval Air Station in, in uh, Halfar in, in Malta. So just some of the pictures there, you can see uh, um, some of the U-10s, they, they were painted white with, a, with their markers on board. Um, they had black and white noses, and there's one green and common in 1980. And I think I've got some more detail on that one at a later stage as well. So in the early 1960s, um, the Canberra U-10s were ferried through RAF Chang'e in, in Singapore um, to Edinburgh Field, which is just north of Adelaide. Um, that's where the Royal Australian Air Force are. They have a base there now. Um, it was designed so it could be flown either manually by the autopilot um, via the pilot's supervisory control panel or by an autopilot via ground radio control. So basically you could have a pilot in there, but he was using the push buttons as you would do, um, which is really replicating what you're getting from the, the VHF. So, um, as I say, a, a pilot aboard flew it via a 13-button panel that simulated the inputs transmitted to the aircraft. When flown without a pilot, the U-10 was controlled via a VHF link from a control van. So you can imagine you have a guy in the van. It would have a certain range that you could use um, in, in those days as well. Um, it also had an explosive abort device in case of emergencies, such as loss of contact. Um, yeah, the, the one here, WH885, in fact, was destroyed on April the 1st at Woomera when control was lost whilst being remotely piloted. Um, the self-destruct switch was activated and the aircraft was blown up. So, um, so if you look at that, that picture there in front of um, the Canberra is um, 216 Squadron Comet C2 as well. And that's just a list um, for posterity of um, all the Canberras and what happened to them. So most of them, <coughs> most of them were actually shot down. There were a few accidents, um, and there were a few that um, that crashed on landing as well. So this one's just a picture of I think this might be WH885, and this no sorry yeah it is actually yeah. yeah. So sorry there's no sound on this, but. Um, it would have gone very quiet at the end anyway. So effectively, the engines um, cut out, stalled, and then it, it looks like it's just about to, to fall. So there you go. That's the way we all end, I suppose. Um, uh, and then the pictures on the right there, you know, that shows a bloodhound uh, interception against um, one of the cameras. Again, this is really early stuff. Um, still pretty good pictures, unless somebody from um, uh, English Electric has drawn that on. You know, you know, you never know. It looks that that middle picture looks very enhanced. That bloodhound, you know. So, um, yeah, this is just a, a one of the stories of one of the U10s, just only because it's still surviving. Um, this one first entered service in in 1953 with 115 Squadron. Um, then moved on to 207 Squadron. It was flown to Sharp Brothers, where it was converted into a, a Mark U-14 radio-controlled and first flew in this configuration in, in 1961. It was used as a drone target by the Royal Navy, so it seemed to manage to get away from that OK. Um, so it was used against Sea Cat and Sea Slug. So I'm not sure what that says about Sea Cat or Sea Slug, but the camera seemed to have got away with it anyway. Um, they were painted all over white with white black bands on them to indicate what they were. Um, it returned to the UK in 1961. In 1963, it was reworked as a B2 with the removal of the, um, the unmanned equipment, the radio control equipment, and it joined the Bomber Maritime Test Squadron. Um, by the 1970s, it was down at Boscombe Down doing ejector seat tests, and then it moved out um, to Martin Baker. Finally dismantled in 1990, but if you're ever down in uh, in Boston Down Aviation, it's still there, it's still alive. It's just waiting for someone to come along with a, a lot of money to, to add on the back end of it and fly it again. 
Now, this, back into Sky Spy, so, I mean, I, I love this one, you know, like I say, um, this was still in the factory whenever I, whenever I joined, and, and all the people who'd worked on it were still there. Um, it was a remotely controlled vertical takeoff and landing aerial reconnaissance vehicle, suitable for use in military or naval, in battlefield areas, and, and so on, but, um, and in those days, there was, again, there was no real requirement for anything, so, um, but it was announced on the 5th of September 1972. Oh, sorry, how do we go back up? Yeah, announced on the 5th of September 1972, Sky Spy was a pilotless um, aerial reconnaissance vehicle. Um, it was very small, structurally and mechanically simple, relatively inexpensive, and it was easily transportable. Its small size and its low power also conferred a number of operational advantages, such as a low radar and IR signature, a low noise levels, a low gust response, and a very small visual silhouette, all of which contributed to a low damage risk under operational conditions. Surveillance could be carried out at all angles of attack between conventional forward flight and hover. A wide variety of applications was envisaged, including army reconnaissance, naval over the horizon viewing, weapons control and delivery, including the capability of providing a command link for over the horizon weapon control systems, target spotting, coast guard surveillance, border patrol, police duties, fishery protection, search and rescue operations, forest fire spotting and emergency relief and medical support service. You would have thought with all of those potential requirements, one of them would have came through. <laughs> but um, so Shorts initiated a company funded development program and um, they were demonstrating the flight vehicle before the end of 1974. Now the airframe, um, the basic vehicle consisted of a, a center body which carried the engine, the fuel and the control and the stabilization actuators. It had a low pressure fan and an axially symmetric duct connected to the center body by an engine mounting spider and by stators. The airfoil surfaces for pitch roll and yaw and rotational stabilization are set across the duct exit. So we're using the, um, the outflow from the duct to provide the force uh, on, on the, the, the fins. Um, the center body comprised the major part of the vehicle weight, the duct being a simple light but rigid structure. It had an equipment payload pod fairing, which was located on the outer surface of the duct and indexed in line with the forward duct support. The autopilot and the power supply equipment were at the rear in the wall of the duct. The power plant, um, it had lift and propulsive thrust, which were obtained by vectoring the gross thrust output of a single stage, multi-blade, fixed pitch, low pressure ducted fan powered by a small piston engine. So in the prototype, a two cylinder inline hearth engine of 60 horsepower was used. And this was augmented by the aerodynamic force components generated on the duct surfaces and the inlet lip. In terms of operational equipment, uh, the payload included TV camera, sensors, automatic um, data collection, um, and other equipment installed in the pod fairing on the outer forward surface. So Sky Spy was supposed to be flown under remote controls to the chosen surveillance area, where it would hover and relay positional data back to the base station using a secure data link. So to give you an idea of scale, um, the diameter was about three foot six, um, or about a, just over a meter. Um, the, the fan diameter was about um, two feet nine, or 0.85 meters, and the maximum takeoff weight was about 286 pounds, or 130 kilos. So in terms of performance, depending on operational requirements, um, a vehicle of the size quoted could operate at altitudes of up to 6,000 feet, and typically it would carry 44 pounds of payload for a sortie of about one and a half hours duration. So um, the two guys in the picture I know really well. The guy in the bottom was Big Mervyn. He was always known as Big Mervyn. I think every factory has a Big Mervyn, and they're always really tall. Um, and uh, Ian Lasbury on, on the right. And like I say, whenever I was there, that, that actual vehicle was still there in, uh, in 1986. The result was the short Sky Spy. The Sky Spy was an unmanned aerial vehicle, or UAV. It was meant to be used for reconnaissance in tactical military operations. Like the Coleoptere, 
The Sky Spy used an annular wing draped around an engine. In theory, the Sky Spy would take off from behind the front line. Under the guidance of a forward air controller, the UAV would fly across enemy lines and take pictures of troop movements. The plane would then be flown back to friendly territory and landed vertically. Although the Sky Spy was never put into service, unmanned tactical reconnaissance planes remain a popular concept among military planners worldwide. So that was that was the mid seventies, you know, and I think again the money ran out and there was no requirement. Like who on earth would want an, an unmanned aerial vehicle would have been the, the thing. But um, at the same time, Westlands were, were doing a similar activity. So they had a system called WISP. WISP was the one on the bottom right. Um, and that was delivered, developed by Westland Helicopters as, as a future battlefield surveillance system. So the MOD issued a preliminary spec in 71. Um, Westland designed and built a proof of concept system. Um, so I think in the, what happened in the end was they sort of pushed the shorts one out, but which is a blessing in disguise because Westland invested a lot more money and then it was cancelled in, in the end too. So development came to an end in around 1977. Um, so WISP was developed, let's see what I have here, yeah. Yeah, the Ministry of Defence was quite intrigued by the system and it issued that spec in 1971. Um, unwilling to wait until the TV cameras was ready, Westland Helicopters designed and built a proof of concept prototype fitted with a pair of contra-rotating rotors powered by two piston engines. Um, the, the Westland WR05 moat made its first flight in June 1975. The MOD was so impressed that it put up money to develop a larger design that would be closer to an operational vertical takeoff UAV, which it might use in Northern Ireland. You think people who, some of the younger people here, um, you think, why would you want to use that in Northern Ireland? Well, 1970s Northern Ireland was a different place, uh, and it would have been quite handy there. Although, I can just imagine one of those things landing in my back garden. You know, you used to look up and see helicopters, but you would imagine a lot of these things flying around. Um, so the first three, first of three uh, WISPs made its first flight in 1976. Within a year, the MOD concluded that the payload was too small. Westlands kept at it though and developed a larger one called the WR07 or Wide Eye to fulfill a new British Army program. A prototype flew in 1978. Westlands received the contract to build three or four, but control of the VTUF vertical takeoff UAV was still problematic when it was cancelled in 1979. Um, it later developed a stealthy vertical takeoff UAV based on its earlier work. The, the Sharp Eye, though, was abandoned in the early 1980s before a prototype was actually built. So, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on in the 70s, and you sort of think, what would have happened if we'd continued with that? I suppose it's the same with a lot of programs that were cancelled. Um, you could have had something. So moving away from, from Sky Spy, and another thing that we did in shorts was target aircraft, and it led on to what we were proposing as a UAV. So I, I was um, one of the engineers working on this as a young fella, um, and we used this for a, a target aircraft to shoot blowpipes and so on at. Um, the early ones used a McCulloch engine, that then moved on to a Westlake 432 engine, 26 horsepower engine. Um, we had an integral parachute on that. It was just behind um, where you see target um, in the, there's a bay just behind that. Um, or maybe it was just in front of it. But there's a, on the fuselage, there was a, a small parachute, which was used, if you hit it, uh, there's a cut down parachute come up and it, it, it flew down. It was actually very robust. Um, it was built out of folded aluminium panels and a lot of fiberglass and the guys were routinely patching these things back together. And now my specialism was uh, an aerodynamicist. I came out of Kuwait University. I'm an aerodynamicist. Things have to be really clean lines and so on. You know, These things were crashing into the dirt. They were slopping a little bit of fiberglass onto them, putting them all back together. Bits were bent and stuff, and they were taken off. You know, And I was going, oh, but the, the drag coefficient could be up by 0.037 or something. Who gives a shit, you know, <laughs> off we go, you know. So, so it was, it was, it was my size of an aircraft, 11 foot with a, um, a fixed cord for about 18 inches. 
and the target had the ability to carry flares, mist distance indicator and laser receiver pods, which we used for proving out um, star streak and um, uh, starburst uh, laser beam riding systems. Um, Skeet Mark II was an improved lateral stability by attaching an end plate onto the top of the tail fin. So you see that, that tail uh, on the top, you've got a horizontal uh, plate there, which really just increases the effective aspect area and gives you a bit more lateral, lateral stability. It was scary in that it was launched from a catapult. So you see that, that catapult there, like stand well back. So you're, you're, you're launching 160 pounds. I don't know what that is in real money. Um, at 100 feet per second, and um, that happens in the length of that launcher. So you pressurize those two big cylinders up, and then um, when you hit go, this thing came flying up along this. Now, to prove, I remember to prove this thing, um, someone thought it would be a bright idea to test it with a block of concrete of the right mass, but they, they hadn't expected it to go quite as far, so it was in the car park um, behind a technical building, and <laughs> And they cranked this thing up and fired it. And this block of concrete went. So there's big X mark. It will, it will land here. And it went over just to over the top of the canteen and landed just short of the fence. You know, so we got away with it. But it could have been, uh, again, one of those things that, that you would, you'd read about in the paper. But um, it was a really interesting uh, aircraft. But uh, I mentioned earlier there's there three different um, uh, engine variants. The McCulloch engine moving into the Westlake. And then finally the Norton Rotary. The Norton Rotary was about 42 horsepower, I think we got out of it, um, at about 8,000 RPM. Um, really high powered, but we, so we put this, this thing onto that, that aircraft that I showed you, which was designed to fly at um, probably about 120 knots max. So we said to the, the trials guys, be careful, first flight, just be careful. So you might as well talk to the wall. So they got this thing on straight up full throttle and everything. It got up to about 180 knots and then of course they put full elevator on. So what do you think happened? Um, the wing just folded. <laughs> just pulled the wing off and it fell to the ground. So from then on we had to put a, a, a limiter on it so we could get the speed up but you couldn't put the, the elevator on at the same time. But um, I think the, the trials team also had a, a black market going on in those engines. I think they were when they were fired, they were sort of sold off on the side. Really good engines. In fact, it's the same engine that Banshee. Banshee then took over from um, Skate, um, took over the targets market, um, used the same engine. And, um, and then when it became the only, it's, only, it's the only UAV you can use in a lot of the, the uh, MOD ranges at the minute. It's the only one that's approved. And of course, Kinetic um, have it, so it's a sort of closed market. But it's a good engine. It's a good engine, good aircraft. And um, so, they, <laughs> forgive me for this. This is out of my notebook from 1989. Um, it's the only surviving picture of the Skeet Mark III, which was a, a concept we'd come up with in, um, in those days when we thought, okay, this is the way things are going. We want uh, an asset that can be used either as a high speed target or can be used as a surveillance asset. So, and um, we had uh, sensors on there, we had IR cameras, with this, that, and the other. We planned it all out. We, um, I did all of the aerodynamics, the performance, the layout, because it's a small company, small project. It was, it was actually fantastic getting the opportunity to do all of those things. Um, it was a 13 foot wingspan, twin boom aircraft, um, had a pusher puller configuration, and you could use. You could use either just a puller or you could use a push pull and you could get up to about 200 knots. Um, it had a large fuselage, so you could either use for increased fuel storage or you added cameras. Now, if you, in those days, um, cameras were big. You know, they're, they're not the sort of things they are now. So you had, you could stuff that thing. Um, it was really good. We built a full scale prototype. Uh, there was a company called Tasuma. I think it might, might have been target aircraft systems and unmanned aircraft. It was a, a one-man band, basically, but it was a good company. And they built up a prototype for us. Um, now, in those days, things were less official. So we were sort of building this, although we didn't quite have a, a project code. I'm sure some of you might have been familiar uh, about how things might have been done. 
So, but wait, this, it's hard to hide a 13 foot wingspan aircraft in your factory. Um, so one day, the chief exec was doing a tour of the factory, walking around, you know, clean that up, this sort of thing. And he came across this, um, this 13 foot wingspan aircraft. He said, where'd this come from? Who owns this? Um, I, I should read you that one English accent, but I can't. You know, even he was a quite a posh Englishman who ran the company at the time. But uh, he said, where's this come from? He said, oh, sir, this, this is called an unmanned aerial vehicle. In the future, they're going to be really important. They're going to take the place of, of aircraft. And he says, no, they're not. Who told you that? I never want to see this ever again. There's no future for unmanned aerial systems. So that was the end of it. <laughs> so sadly, we had to chop it up because we, we sort of gone as far as we could. But um, it had a lot of potential, but there you go. Time to move on. Um, another one was short stiletto, which um, I worked just in the, in the last days of this, but really um, this came from the US, but we built it on license in, in Belfast. Um, it was 1959, US Navy and Air Force issued a joint request for one. Beechcraft, who are now part of Raytheon, um, they won the competition with this, uh, with this vehicle. It had a um, liquid rocket motor, um, and it's now known as the AQM-37. Now, there are lots of different versions for that. Um, the AQM-37A was followed by a number of variants intended to simulate different types of threats. So there were, there were different versions to, to replicate different threats. Um, the one that came to Belfast was the AQM-37C, and we manufactured that under license, as I was saying. So um, the, the highest speed it could get to was around Mach Mach 4.7, I think it achieved over in the States. Now, interestingly, so we, we, did, we built this in the, in the UK, as I say, it was launched from the Canberra, so Canberra came up again, and it was fired at the Hebrides. Well, the thing that got me at the time was the, the, um, the jet engine was made by Harley Davidson, believe it or not. So Harley Davidson in the States made small jet engines. I never got my hands on one. That would have been another one for the desktop, but I never got, got one. Um, we did a lot of the store separation analysis, so because it came off the camera, we had to get that all proved. Um, we used some codes called, it was an, a Nathan Engineering and Research Code, but the REE modified it, so it was called Rainier at the time. Um, we worked with REE Founder quite a lot on that. Um, it was originally done by Short Aircraft, um, where I am now, but then they transferred that work to the Defence Systems Division, where I was then, <laughs> and um, so I was doing some work. Now, uh, the, the fastest one we ever did in the UK that I remember was about Mach 3.5. Um, um, we had some difficulty with that in that the end plates fell off, and um, I was uh, at that stage doing some uh, kinetic heating analysis for Star Streak and some other programs we're working on. So when I had a look at it, I mean, Mach 3.5, you, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, you get hot, but the, the adhesive that was being used to hold the end plates on wasn't sufficient for the temperatures that you would have experienced. So and that, at least that was, I was able to prove that was the, the issue and then the, the change it from then on. Um, but where it was built uh, in number nine factory in Castlereagh, and I know, David, you've been over there a few times, um, that's where Stiletto was being built um, in the mid to late 80s. That's now office. Um, that's completely um, filled with uh, desks at the moment. So we finished making Stiletto in, in 1992. But um, it was, it, it popped up in the press every now and again. You know, um, this is from an Irish newspaper, um, Missile Hit Wicklow Mountain. So um, it's, they would go astray, so they're fired from Aberforth as well. These things would sometimes turn up. Um, they're also, it was accused of hitting aircraft and also, you, know, you can imagine, you know, these things popped up all the time. Um, so you can, uh, you can look at that in your leisure, but really, um, so they, they talked about it could have been shot down by one of these drones. So one of the, the last things I was going to talk about then was square body storage dispensers. So again, this is stretching the un uncrewed aer aerial systems a wee bit, but it was uncrewed, it was doing stuff. Um, and so I don't remember if any of you were involved, but way back, so prior to Storm Shadows, I know some of the older guys 
Tim, um, we, we talk about storm shadow. So prior to that, there was a, a family of uh, things that were studied. So we worked very closely with the REE. Um, Euclid was the first one. I love the names. Euclid was the experimental unpowered climbing and diving system. And, and that was a release from a buccaneer at West Free. And I was there for one of the trials. It was fantastic. So it came off um, the bottom of the aircraft. It stabilized itself. And then it was programmed to, to climb up and then to dive down. But the story at the time was when the, the pilot launched this thing, um, no one told him that this thing was going to be climbing up. So he thought this was going to be dropping into. So he's, he's flying the plane, he, he release, and then he's sort of going, shit, what's that? <laughs> and so he had to, he, he sort of got, it, got himself out of that. But that's the way it was. It was really just proven um, that you could do those sorts of things. It, was, it wasn't a pretty thing, it was like a, like a big coffin. Um, so um, now nobody was in it at the time. Yep. The Great White Whale. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. Yes, it wasn't pretty, but um, it was fu it was functional. Yeah. Um, so Britvik was the next one, another great name. I think the name was made up by REE as well. So Britvik was the British recoverable innovative test vehicle with impulse control. Um, now we talked earlier about specification growth. So this was going to be had to be re repeated once. Well, during the development, they said, "No, we want to fly this thing eight times or something." So you're dropping something which weighed several hundred kilos, maybe a ton, from about 5,000 feet into the sea, and then you want to pick it out and then um, do it again and again. So you can imagine what happened from, um, it, was an it was supposed to be an iteration of Euclid, which was a one-off test. So of course the mass then started to creep up. So it started off as a stress skin aircraft, almost, and ended up with an I-beam. So our stress, our stress office got a hold of it. They put an I-beam down the center of it. So the mass went up by a factor of about four and the inertia and, and everything else changed. So although we, and because of the time to do things, we had designed it to have the impulse controllers on it. So impulse was to try and kick it. So you'd get some pitch yaw and stability at the start before you deployed your wings. And you're supposed to be firing these impulse motors to, to tip, tip you down. But so we, we set the contract for the impulse motors and they went away and did their thing. Meanwhile, the mass was going like this, you know. So whenever we got the impulse motors, they weren't actually strong enough to do anything. Um, but it was still an interesting test. You could see that the logic was right and it was firing and so on, but um, it wasn't so, wasn't so useful. But what it did have was a big parachute at the end to stabilize it, you know, so because that was to lower it into the sea as well. So all of those systems, and again, that, that, those things were done in a couple of years. And you sort of look back and think, you know, why, why can we not do those sorts of things now in a couple of years? But um, you'll notice in that picture in the top, uh, I don't know if any of you know the guys in um, ARA Tunnel in, in Bedford. Um, um, I remember it well, that was 1987. You see the young guy there in the fashionable light blue trousers? That was me. And I'll tell you a story about the shirt and the trousers. When I came back from that, um, I did my washing, got my ironing done. I know this sounded a bit weird. Anyway, got my ironing done, sitting on the table, went out to have a few pints, came back. Burglars had broken into my house, stole my TV, and stole my ironing. <laughs> so I didn't replace those light blue trousers, by the way. I'm sure you're glad to know that. Um, yeah, so bottom picture, you, the, the Buccaneer, if you're in Farnborough, which I'm sure a lot of you have been to, that's the same Buccaneer that we did the, the drops from. That was the RAE um, system that was there. So, and here we go. This is the Buccaneer um, trial. There you go. Comes off. Went on stable. Parachute comes out. And then it, it sort of more or less falls into the sea. But during that time, it wasn't just a dumb thing. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of inertial, early inertial sensors. A lot of rate sensors on board. Like I said, the logic was in there for the impulse controllers, the impulse motors were firing. So it was, it was a very useful trial. Um, but obviously we didn't, the contract went on. To, I think it became Storm Shadow in the end, that one, yeah. In fact, we did the, the uh, I think I mentioned it in the previous slide there, um, SRA 1238, we did the contract for aerodynamic design and wind tunnel testing. We did the wind tunnel testing, but there was, no, there was no contract to analyze the wind tunnel test data. 
Um, so, we <laughs> so we came back with that, if you remember, all those big magnetic tapes. And um, sorry, there's no booking code for looking at those, and there's no contract, and you know. So it was never, ever looked at, even though we'd done all the tests. So Mosquito, I'm just going to finish up now. So Mosquito was the generation after next on Cruder, our combat system, which is part of Lanka. So as you know, Mosquito is a classified program, um, so I can't go into any details. Um, if I told you anything, I'd have to shoot you, and then I'd get shot as well. So um, as I was saying, this is uh, not on behalf of Spirit, so what I have isn't um, anything that is uh, from them. This is just stuff on the internet. Um, yeah, so Lanka, um, it was announced by the RAF RCO in July 2019, and it was really looking at um, how you can go about producing um, um, an uncrewed system to complement the F-35 and, and Typhoon. Um, what they were trying to do was look at how you go about designing aircraft rapidly um, to achieve dramatic reductions in cost and development. Uh, and it was, it was very successful, but I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, um, although the, the customer might want you to work really fast and, and make good progress and so on, it's whenever you're working in a, a quite regulated environment, it's n still not easy. You still have to meet all the same. So it doesn't matter how much people want you to move fast, you still have to do all of the same stuff. Um, so, but we did make quite a lot of progress on, on Mosquito. Um, phase one produced a preliminary system design for an unmanned, unmanned air vehicle, and phase two was planned to further mature that. So um, Mosquito was an uh, unmanned combat air, air vehicle technology demonstrator um, in development by Team Mosquito in the UK. So um, in January 21, the aircraft was chosen as a technology demonstrator um, for the system, which was first came up with in, in 2015. It was designed to operate alongside the Eurofighter Typhoon, the F-35, and also Tempest. It was designed to accommodate a range of weapons which were already in service and which could, were foreseen to be in service when this came into, into reality. Um, Spirit, which are based in Belfast, we were the, the aircraft prime contractor, and we were um, supposed to start full-scale flight tests in, in 2023. So, um, there wasn't a lot of detail uh, online, obviously, uh, and there wouldn't be, but the, the whole intention was that it was going to design to offer increased protection, survivability, and information to manned aircraft when it's flying alongside them. So it's really the loyal wingman uh, concept that you, you would have heard of. Um, it was set to be the UK's first unman unmanned platform, which is able to target and shoot down enemy aircraft while surviving against surface air missiles. Um, there's a number of concept images which, which you may have seen. Now, sadly, they're making a lot of good progress, but things are moving on globally uh, as well as within the MOD. So um, Project Mosquito um, will, will, will not proceed beyond the design phase. That was a decision taken on 24th of June 2022. Uh, and that decision was just taken by mutual agreement with the industry partners. So th this is a RAF statement, by the way. Um, the decision taken by mutual agreement uh, followed a detailed review of the te technical demonstrator and really what they were looking for. Um, so, you know, we, what they were looking for was looking for something smaller, more equitable, perhaps um, lower cost, um, rather than something at this stage. It's not that they didn't want this, it's just that they didn't want it now. That was the, the phrase. So 2035, yes, perhaps after 2035, but what we need now, um, and you can see what's really happened in Ukraine and so on, what they were looking for was smaller, lower cost, many more attributable systems. And yes, we do need this, but we're sort of, um, we're, we're busy, you know. So um, that was the decision. So um, again, back in, the, in June 22, the next steps were then proposed by um, Jez Holmes, who's actually moved on now. Um, so through Project Mosquito, um, we learned an awful lot. Um, we gained significant value and understanding um, 
and the decision maximizes the learning accrued to date and enables the change of direction. So, like I said, they've changed the direction. And, and, and in fact, uh, you may be aware of the, the RAF published their strategy for UAS, um, uh, I think it was two weeks ago. Um, and in that, you know, they've defined the categories one, two, three, and really they're more interested in CAT 2, CAT 3, which is the smaller systems rather than CAT 1 at the minute. So, which is, you know, it's a shame in that, um, you know, the work was ongoing. We've actually built um, the wing and the tail for the aircraft. Um, a lot of the systems work was ongoing. We had the engine chosen and so on. But, and we understand, you know, that we're not a wealthy community. Uh, we don't have the luxury of spending money on, on programs which aren't necessary right now when there are other more bigger demands. So, so sadly, I think from, from our perspective, that's what's really happened. The RAF at this stage wants something else. Um, and perhaps in the future, they'll come back towards um, something like um, a loyal wingman. Now, having said that, in the US, there's still a lot of progress being made at all the all the main players like um, Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and, and Boeing and um, General Atomics, they all have versions of a loyal wingman which are flying. Some of them look remarkably like a mosquito. Um, so, and they're working along and now, so the US um, have made statements they want to have lots of these things in service. I don't know if there's actually any contracts over in the US either, but um, so it has moved on. But anyway, that's where we are with Mosquito. I'm sorry I couldn't show you any more pictures, but um, just because of the nature of things, I, w I wasn't allowed to. But it was an interesting project. It's, uh, it's interesting for me in that I left Tales to go down to work on Mosquito, and as soon as I got through the door, they said, we're, we're going to cancel that project. So <laughs> but these things happen. Um, so thank you for your attention. Sorry, just a wee bit late there. And um, hopefully things won't always go the way this aircraft was. Um, um, and also, we hope that Mosquito won't be the last uncrewed aerial system to come out of Belfast. Um, perhaps there'll be some others. So thanks very much for listening. And thanks again to the Royal Aero Weapons Systems Technology Panel for allowing me to speak. Uh, and thanks to all the audience for coming. Thank you. Uh, Chris Gibson of the uh, Heritage Specialist Group. Uh, might have a might have an answer for your R and your gyro. Yes. Uh, I used to work for a, a subsidiary of Sperry, and their origin lay in Russell Latitude Systems. Oh, Russell. Yeah, so maybe that's what it is. Yeah. My question is: Was Sky Spy ever operationally trialled? No, it was only ever flown in the um, tethered configuration that you saw there. There were a number of flights done on the airfield, but it never went any further than that. I think getting clearance was probably one of the issues as well. Um, so we knew that if it was tethered, we can do enough to prove the operation. But I don't think um, either the company or the UK were ready to let something like that go unless it was on a range, but it never went beyond those views. I think when it was privately funded, it's once you start doing trials overseas and, and different ranges, it starts to become more and more expensive. So it didn't go that far. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Richard Gearing, the uh, incoming president elect of the society. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, you mentioned regulation, and we've got the CAA in the building in a few weeks' time as well. Um, the MAA are looking at it as well. But obviously, as we move into whatever we want to call them, our powers, our PVs, you know, what do you think we need to do from a sort of regulatory standpoint to achieve some of this faster, quicker kind of as we've seen in Ukraine? Yeah. Well, I think there's a few things. Um, it, trying to catch up with some of the other countries in terms of even air corridors within the UK. Um, opening up some specific corridors that can be used. Trialling in the UK has always been problematic unless you're on an army range. Um, and I know there are other companies in, 
in, in the audience here who've had to go to other countries to do those sorts of things. Um, so I do think um, if we were to look at that with a positive mindset about the UK needs to be moving forward, what do we need to do to be the best in the world at that? What do we need to do in terms of regulation? How can we assist rather than the other way around where you propose something and you're trying to fit it into existing regulations when it really doesn't fit? So um, I know, for instance, in the Republic of Ireland, so just you know, 50 or 60 miles from where I live, they have a bit more uh, liberal attitude. That they've already opened some systems there that are doing drone deliveries, for instance. Um, they've been doing that for several years on a small pilot system, but even so, I don't think there's anything like that in the UK. So um, I think that would be one of the things that I would probably try to do. Um, and it's, an, it's a national thing. Where do we want the UK to be? Do we want to be leaders or do we want to be followers? And at the minute we're even behind the followers. So um, I think I would probably encourage them to look at it in, anew and think, what do we need to do if we want to be in um, the business for, I mean, look at, look at Turkey, for instance. Turkey from nowhere came to be world leaders in, in unmanned systems. Um, they're exported all over the world. They're, um, and they have a, a much better regulated system to allow you to do things. So we could use those, uh, use Turkey as a, an exemplar, perhaps. What do we need to do to be like that? I'm not saying it's easy, um, but I think that's what I would encourage them to do. Thanks, uh, Tony Osborne. And with your hypersonics head on, <laughs> is the UK ready to start making serious investments? Are the skills there to start moving into sort of the hypersonics game? We've done pretty well in guided weapons. Yeah. Can we do this? In well, it, yeah, yeah it's, it's a really good point. Um, what we have done, which is really encouraging, is they've set up Team Hypersonics UK. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it, it's an industry, academia, um, and uh, government, MOD, uh, which looks across. And what they've been looking at is deciding on what technologies we need to develop. So y you're, 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 very, you're very right. I mean, uh, just as I was saying earlier, we haven't done anything hypersonic really here since the 60s. So we have done some high supersonic stuff, um, for instance, Starship's Max 3.5, some of the other uh, Meteor, maybe Mach 4 or something. So, but, you know, getting beyond that, um, there's not a lot of experience in, in here. Um, so um, Team Hypersonics UK is identifying what technologies, and not just technologies, capabilities and even facilities we need. Now, so they do have a lot of money over the next 10 years. I don't know if that's actually committed, but it's certainly been promised. Um, and what they're hoping to do soon is I, um, kick off some of the initial projects on that. So that's all, it still hasn't happened. But um, it's certainly encouraging that they're, they're looking widely across the entire country. So, you know, I think some of the statements have been made before by MOD that um, there's no one company in the UK could design a hypersonic system. It's going to take an, a national effort. It's going to require, um, so all of the universities, all of the industries, all working collaboratively together. So um, it's a big challenge, I think. Um, and it's, it's a big challenge, not just in terms of the technology, but actually getting companies to work together like that. It's not common. Um, you know, so it, it's difficult to get people to share IP and, you know, lawyers get involved and, you know, the engineers will probably say, yeah, let's go, let's go. But actually getting agreements and so on could be more difficult.